This is Canada Reads American Style, featuring two friends who love Canada Reads and Canadian literature. Welcome our host Rebecca from Michigan and Tara from Ontario. Hi everyone, it is Rebecca and Tara and I have a really fun thing to discuss today. We sort of, I think one of us saw this on an Instagram post or something, but the subject is five books that define our taste. So Tara and I are going to go back and forth and talk about, you know, a book and then neither one of us has told the other what we're going to discuss. So I think we're going to both be really surprised yeah. when we hear our titles, right? I think, you know what, you may not be too surprised by some of mine. I'll be honest. Ooh, okay. I was kind of like, I am fairly predictable. In my head, anyways, I'm like, yeah, Tara, come <laughs> on. That's, there's no surprises here. But Well, I think mine, mine are all old school titles. Oh. Yeah, like old school titles. So we'll see. Yeah. I think we'll, yeah. uh, we'll see if how many of these we will have heard of at the okay. end. So, okay, cool. Okay. So I'll let yeah. you go first. Okay. So the way I approached this, I, hmm, it was really interesting. I went way back to like my childhood, Mm. to books that I still read or that I like a phase, a stage in my reading life that continues to the present. I love that. Okay. So I'm going to start with my first category which is actually an author, and it would be L-M-M, uh, blah, sorry about that, Lucy Maud Montgomery. Yay. Yay. So I just put her as a whole category. I was trying to think, I'm like, do I do childhood books that I still love? Do I do this? And I'm like, dang it, I'm just putting her as her own category because I return to, so I'm using in particular, of course, the Anna Green Gables book because that's where I was originally, that's how I was introduced to her writing was with that first book, but I will read any book of hers that I can find. I pick up like academic books on critical writing Ooh. about her writing and stuff. I just, her biographies, her letters, I her journals, I will just read anything concerning Lucy Maud Montgomery. So I'm like, she gets her own category. I love that. Yeah. And, and you know, there was a picture book I think I told you about it. It's fairly new. I think it came out this yes. past year and it's really beautifully illustrated. And it's a woman who also feels the same way about her as the author and just did this really beautiful picture book. And I'll have to check and see if you've read that. Yes, I haven't. You did. You shared it with me. And I think I was at, in a bookstore at the time and couldn't find it. And I haven't looked for it since. So thank you for the reminder. I'm going to check it out next time in a, I'm at the bookstore too. Yeah, and we'll put that we'll link to it in our in the show notes mm-hmm. because I did get a copy of it from my library. Oh, did and you? yeah, it was it was really I mean it's just really it's visually beautiful. Yeah. And she sticks obviously very true to the story of, you know, of Anna yeah. Green Gable. So it was just really beautiful. I loved it. So Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So that's my first one. And I also like I was I think I first read and when I was maybe 10, 11, I can't remember, around that age. And I read her, the books, the Anne series, regularly, like, you know, every few years kind of thing, I go through the whole series. And I find that as an adult, I find something new in the series that I, in the books that I didn't see when I was a kid, right? So, and I love that part of it, so. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, I just read the first book this year for the first mm-hmm. time. I had seen the PBS series we had back, like I think in the eighties or something like yeah. that. It was a really long time ago, and I loved it, but I never read the books. And so I bought all the books, and I'm really looking forward to reading all of them because that just that first one, it was just like it's like magic. You read it, it and it transports you to a time, and it's just it was so beautiful. So, yeah. Okay, your turn. Okay, well. My first book, it's kind of similar in, in a way because it, my this reading habit started when I was young, but I, a few years ago, somebody on Instagram or something had this post that said you were supposed to list the 10 books that really, you know, um, changed your life or I don't know, something like that. Yeah. And when I started really thinking about it from childhood up to current, I realized 
there was a pattern to it that I had never recognized. I had never connected the dots. And I'm like, God, I'm not that smart, I guess, because turns out what I love are books that are set in urban areas at the turn of the uh, 20th century. So in the early 1900s. And I had never realized how much I was reading books from that time period and how they they were sort of always my favorites. And then oh. finally, seriously, like I connected the dots went, duh, yeah. my grandmother, my great-grandmother, great-grandparents, they came to the United States from Hungary in the early <laughs> 1900s. <laughs> and my grandmother's story of coming here was just this incredible, she was the matriarch of our family and it was this incredible family story. Um, but anyway, so I, it, that's when I realized, oh my God, that's why I've been reading those books all yeah. along. It's like in tribute or something to my grandmother. Yeah. Anyway, so the book I want to mention is The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, which is a great American classic. It was set in the early 1900s and it was a Lithuanian family that had come and they were settled in the Chicago area. And it was a really hard scrabble life. And that is what always fascinated me are people who eked out a living under extreme conditions, because again, that kind of is what happened with my family. Mm -hmm. And this story, I just remember it breaking my heart. It was actually a Christmas gift that I gave myself one year. I said, I'm going to read this over Christmas. And I did. And it was heartbreaking because no matter how hard this family worked to get ahead and try to just realize that American dream, so to speak, it was two steps forward, three steps back. And so it's just a yeah. brilliant novel. And of course, it's a great American classic. And so, yes, so that definitely defines one of the categories that I'm most drawn to in fiction. Hmm. I've never heard of that book. It's one of the things about it that was really, from a historical standpoint, was the the family worked in... Um, like meat processing and or slaughtering slaughterhouse. Yeah. And so the conditions that Upton Sinclair studied and wrote about actually changed a lot of the laws at the time in the United States because they were so cruel to the humans who worked in those places and all, obviously the animals as well. So it was yeah. kind of really famous for that probably more than anything. So yeah. Do you know what year it was published in? It, it, you know, it could have been like 1905, something oh, like wow. that. Yeah, it was really, um, it was, yeah. And it's, again, it's a great American classic. Yeah. It's one that I don't know how people feel about reading it because like I said, I did it as a Christmas present to myself, but probably most people read it like in college or in high school or something yeah. and maybe felt compelled to, or forced to read it, you know, for an assignment. Yeah. Whereas I read it because I just remember it, that it was years ago and I just remember thinking, I just want to read something really like gritty and, you know, tough. And it was that for sure. So, yeah. You know, what most of us read over the Christmas holidays. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know when I told my fr my colleagues at work, you know, I was in Sacramento at the time. I remember them looking at me like, oh, okay. I probably, most people read like Christmas romances and stuff. Yeah. And I'm reading, yeah, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. So, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, Rebecca. I know. I'm an oddball. <laughs> Okay, for my second category, I went with Canadian Lit. So, because I fell in love with Canadian Lit in university when I took my first Canadian Lit class. Yeah. And I continue, it con continues to be the focus of what I read. You know, like I read widely and varied, but Canadian Lit is always there. You know, everything else kind of percolates around it. And the book that I chose for this was uh, is Mercy Among the Children by mm -hmm. David Adams Richards. Yeah. Because in addition to Canadian lit, I truly love any Canadian lit that's from the East Coast, from the Atlantic provinces. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's from New Brunswick. The book was published in 2000. I'm just going to read like a little. So it's a little older, not 1905, but it's a little <laughs> It's a little older. I'm just going to read a little synopsis of it in case uh, anyone doesn't know about it so that they can be intrigued and hopefully pick it up. Okay, so when 12-year-old Sidney Henderson pushes his friend Connie off the roof of a local church in a moment of anger, he makes a silent vow. 
Let Connie live and he will never harm another soul. When Connie stands up, laughs, and walks away, what follows for Sidney is an adulthood in which his rural community uses his pacifism to exploit him. As an adult, when Sidney is blamed for the death of a, of a young boy, Sidney's son, Lyle, must take a stance in defense of his family. And that's all I'm going to tell you. Wow. It is heartbreaking, but it's also beautiful. Uh, Richards is an amazing writer. He always amazes me with his sentences, what he can put into one sentence. And I think I've, I apologize because I know I've mentioned him before on multiple podcasts because I love him this much. Mm -hmm. But I also love that he shows um, a beauty and a sense of hope in all of his characters. So not just the characters that we are meant to like, which you will with Sydney. Sydney's a beautiful human being. But he chooses also the characters. He writes about the characters that we won't like, but you will see a motivation into their actions that you can at least start to understand the character. And I love my books with a little bit of like, I like dark books, but I like a little bit of beauty and hope. And that's what I think he puts into his. Yeah. And I've just read the one with you and you have talked about him a lot, but you know, yeah, I think I it's a good, story. no, no, no. I think it's a good thing because I'm not sure. Do you think a lot of people know of him? Do you, have you talked to a lot of people that have read him? No. Or Yeah. No, see? Yeah. yeah. So I think I, he's well known in certain circles. Mm -hmm. But it's been, he hasn't uh, published a lot in the last few years, although he is still publishing. But he, it's not the, it's not a well-known name, I don't think, at the yeah. moment. So I think you should just keep promoting him okay. as much as you can. because No, seriously, because I do, no, but I think people don't, aren't really aware of him. and. Yeah. I just read the one with you. I'm definitely, that one's on my list to read, uh, Mercy Among the Children for sure. But um, I mean, I, that first book I read of his, mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. And I do look forward to reading him, you know, reading his other books as well. So awesome. yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. Okay. So my next category for myself because I was when I started to think of the five, I like that you kind of went back to the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking more like, okay, so if somebody wanted to recommend a book to me, these are kind of the five categories where I would say, if you recommend something within these five categories, most likely going to read it, right? Yeah. So the next one is picture books. Because yeah. I am, I started out as a, uh, an adult services librarian many years ago, and I became a children's librarian because we lost our youth librarian to another job. And they asked me to fill in till they could find somebody. And, and then they opened it up and I loved the job so much. I started doing it and I just fell in love with picture books. So to this day, I go to the library and I will check out you know, like 10 to 20 picture books at a time, bring them home. And, you know, every once in a while, my little Sedonia will be here and we'll read a few together, but I read them just on my own and mm -hmm. I just love picture books. So the one I want to mention is a really special one that a good friend of mine, a former colleague told me about years ago and it's called Miss Rumphius and it's by Barbara Cooney. And this is a book that when I read it, the first time I read it, I cried. I mean, it was just yeah. so beautiful and I've actually read it aloud to children before and I have to suck it up when mm -hmm. I read it because it's just so beautiful and I'm not going to really give it away uh, other than to say it's a book about a little girl who learns how to make the world a more beautiful place and so what I do is whenever somebody has a baby I buy them a copy of this book and I give them a packet of uh, lupin seeds mm -hmm. and in fact the last person I did this for was Lucy and Jesse Thistle. I gave their daughter Rose this book That's with a right. package of seeds. And it was hilarious because Lucy said, did you, did you send us seeds? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> you got to read the books to get why I sent you the seeds. But anyway, but I highly recommend if you're listening to this podcast, please check this book out from your public library. I think it came out in the eighties and I promise you 
you will fall in love with it. The illustrations are so beautiful and so just the, it just the colors are just they're kind of lavender and purplish mm-hmm. and green and and it's just it's just really beautiful. So to this day, I'm a sucker for a great picture book. I often love dog picture books the most too. Yeah. I love that. But I would say a great picture book, and and I do post those to my Instagram feed, which is hilarious because I those are usually the ones that get very little interaction from people. And I get that most people don't read picture books, but I try to follow more like youth librarians and stuff um, to try to get some interaction because I just, I want to share the love I have for picture books Mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. So picture books. Yeah. Nice. I'm going to take a hard right here. Okay. (laughs) I'm afraid it's going to be like, it's probably going to be horror. I swear to God. Is it it horror? horror. (laughs) It is. (laughs) Because I can, like, what? I'm like, I gotta put horror. I have to, because it's so weird. I still find it weird that I love horror books as much as I do. And I was thinking about it today, and it started when I was like young, when we used to be able to order books uh, from Scholastic. Because mm-hmm. bless my mom, she would let me order and read whatever books I wanted to. Like, I so it. I've been. Yep. You know, whatever. And I, so I was not very young, no, because I still lived with my grandmother. So this was like early elementary school, reading a, a book of horror short stories that I'd gotten from Scholastic. So like before Joey Tribbiani was hiding The Shining in <laughs> the freezer, I was hiding that book. I remember, I'm like, I cannot go to sleep with that book looking at me. Like it was, and I remember two of the short stories still have in my head. They terrified me. But I kept reading them. I love them. And I still love them now. So what the one I've chosen, it's my only American author, actually, that's not by design, it just happened to be because I could also pick out some Canadian horror writers. But I went back to where it kind of started. Not that far back, not the childhood one, although if I could have remembered that book, I would have. But I chose Salem's Lot by Stephen King. Oh. Yeah, published in 1975, so like a classic vampire story. And I remember reading this book, and my bedroom at the time was a basement apartment, uh, not a basement apartment, but be- basement bedroom. Mm-hmm. And I swear to God, something scratched at my window, and we don't have any trees or bushes. When I was reading it one night, and I'm like, I swear to God, there's a vampire <laughs> at my window right now. <laughs> And it terrified me. But I love that book. I love that book. So yeah. And I've read some great horrors since. I just I love them so much I find them fun. Oh, you know? I I'm impressed because I I have never read I would say I don't think I've ever read a horror book. At least I don't think. And I and like I've never read Stephen King. I've never yeah. read Dean Koontz. I like I just can't I can't read that stuff. I I'm I would I would have a heart attack, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. They have some great stories. Like they're yeah. truly great stories about the human psyche and the human condition and it's just they're great. I remember a friend of mine once told me, good good close friend of mine told me she she would read any book in the on the planet, all genre, it didn't matter. And she read yeah. there was I think a Stephen King book. It would have been years ago now, but it had something to do with like a cell phone or something. Oh. I don't, Anyway, I'm pretty sure that's what it was with Stephen yeah. King. Anyway, I remember she was telling me about that book, and I just thought, no way. I mean, I just would never – I because I, everybody carries a cell phone, and I yeah. thought, I don't want something in my hand that – you know, anyway, whatever. Like, yeah. yikes. I know. I'm impressed that you have that ability. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going in the opposite yeah. direction okay. again. Because my next one will be humor, something that's funny. Because oh, yeah. you said it so beautifully when we interviewed Ali Hassan recently. The way you said, I, I don't, I'm going to botch this, but you said something about how difficult it is to make people laugh in person, but how much harder it is to make them laugh like in print, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which I thought was so brilliantly stated because I thought it's absolutely true. Yeah. So. I love to laugh. I know as much as I always, I was thinking in interviews often, I take the really serious questions and I, I dig for things that are, you know, really like burning questions in my mind, Mm -hmm. but I do absolutely love to laugh. And so the book that I always go to when somebody says, is there a book that's really funny 
is A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson. And it's a nonfiction account of Bill Bryson, who was born and raised in the Midwest and then moved in, lived in England for a long time. And I'm not sure if he's still in England or if he's come back. I can't remember. But anyway, he decides to walk the Appalachian Trail. And he doesn't really want to do it alone, but he asks all of his friends and nobody wants to do it with him. And finally, this guy he hadn't seen in many, many, many years, he reached out and said, hey, I hear you're going to walk the trail. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to do it as well. And he's like, great. So he shows up, comes up, steps off the plane, Bill sees him and just goes, oh my God, there's no way this guy can walk the Appalachian (laughs) Trail. He was out of shape. He was dressed inappropriately, you know, like just a complete train wreck. And the best part about the book that I loved is how funny it was, is Bill Bryson is, was is deathly afraid of bears. And he was so afraid that he was going to encounter a bear on the trail. And so what I loved about the book is it's really funny. He has this very self-deprecating sense of humor and he just crafts his humor just so beautifully. And it's a natural history of the Appalachian Trail. So again, it mixes that thing that I love about nonfiction Mm -hmm. where I learned something I didn't know with something that just made me laugh through the whole book. And um, so I... Bill Bryson's one of my favorites. Humor, love it. This book is a gem. And it's, you know, it's older, but it's still, yeah. I guarantee you, it will make you laugh. And they, years later, they made a movie out of it. And I honestly can't remember if I saw the movie, but if I did, it didn't resonate. So if you've seen only the movie, screw that, read the book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this book has been on my radar for the last several years. Yeah. And I haven't read it. Yeah. So I just, while you're talking, I went in and officially put it on my TBR because I really want to read it. Yeah. And the other one he wrote that was just really brilliantly funny was In a Sunburned Country about his trip to Australia. And that was also same type of thing. Just freaking make you laugh out loud. Okay. Uh, My next category is the cozy mystery. Ooh. Yes. I love a cozy mystery. And in particular, the uh, Armand Gamanche series by Louise Penny. So mm-hmm. the Three Pines series. Uh, start with book one, which is Still Life. That was first published in 2005. And there are 17 books in the series. And I just saw that there's the 18th book is going to be published in November of this year. Oh. Yes. And I just love them because I want to move there. When I read these mm-hmm. books... They bring me to, it's like a little, it truly is like a little escape to like, again, this sounds weird because it murder happens in this little town, but it's like to this cozy little town where I want to go to the bistro and then go for a walk in the snow in the village square. And then, oops, there's a body, but I'm going to keep on walking (laughs) because Armand's going to be by soon and he'll take care of it. And then I just, I love these books. I love them. Now, let me ask you about that because yeah. I know she is like in especially in Michigan, I have to say, she was wild wildly popular here in Michigan for sure. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure across the United States as well. Yeah. Um, but my question is, all this time that she was so popular, I didn't realize she would classify as a cozy mystery. So tell me what a cozy mystery is, because I just didn't realize she was classified under that category. What I would classify a co- or describe a cozy mystery as like you have a central character who does solves the murders or the, the crimes. And what is central to the books though is a location. Like for me, like that there's really this location mm-hmm. and a even a cast of characters that you can always that it always returns to. So regardless that the story itself becomes is more about the the place and the characters and the murder is incidental or is only helps build the characters itself or the characters themselves rather than it being truly about the solving of the crime. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like as they go through the investigation, something is uh, revealed about one or more of the characters is one of the components then absolutely it's a small town um i i feel like it is but maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be 
like more, maybe it's maybe more of a feeling of community, like a community. The reason I, yeah, the reason I ask Mm -hmm. is because I always thought cozy mysteries were things like, um, you know, there are these book series, let's say, for example, that like, it's about um, uh, baking. And so they'll say like, Mm -hmm. you know, so the, the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's like an abate, it's set in a bakery or it's set in, I don't, I'm trying to think of what other, other kinds of, well, even there was that series called like A is for alibi, B is for whatever. And there's a knitting one. I know there's a knitting yeah, yeah, yeah. one or like something. Knitting. Yep, yep, yep. See, now that's that's how I always thought of Cozy Mysteries as being really driven by like a theme kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So 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 then the, the Louise Penny books fit into that kind of category in that way, a theme or no? Um, not a theme mm-hmm. so much, although Hmm. Because here's why I ask, because I yeah. love, as everybody knows, I love Sarah Pretzky. So Sarah yeah. Pretzky's novels, her mysteries are, you know, same characters set in Chicago. You know, there it's a lot of the same characters from the beginning, you know, however many books, she might have the same number of books, 18 or whatever it is. Yeah. And I would never think of that as cozy. And that's why I try to understand what cozy means because I thought of it more like, like you say, those knitting books or the bakery books yeah. or something. So, but I do know that Louise Penny is considered cozy. And that's why I'm just kind of confused what that category, what that yeah. sort of represents. Yeah. So to me, it's more of a, sounds so like I'm trying to. Um, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot. A, yeah. No, I'm not no, trying to put no, you on the I'm, spot. No, <laughs> I'm fine with this. Just, I'm fine with it. Um, to me, it makes me feel feel cozy do you know what I mean okay. like I mm-hmm. feel like uh so yes it doesn't have the yeah. knitting or anything like that but then the other one I think of when I think of a cozy mystery series oh, and I cannot remember the name of the author I feel like it's set in South Africa oh oh I know which you know, one you're talking about it, right mm-hmm. yeah it's like the detective ladies yes. or something yes something yeah. like that yeah something like that I'm gonna google it and figure it out but to me, as opposed to like a, like a, I'm going to throw it there, like a James Patterson or mm-hmm. one of those, a thriller book that is truly just the whole purpose is to find, to get to a goal, right? A, to re, a resolution of a spy thing or a, who the killer is or the cozy mystery is more the place itself and the characters because the characters and the place, especially for the three pine ones, it carries throughout the whole series. Mm -hmm. Like even when they, there are a couple of books where they're not in three pines, they're in, they could be in Paris, but it still goes back to three pines Mm -hmm. and the characters still come back to that area. So to me, it's not so much like I know what you mean about the knitting and the baking. Yeah. But to me, I don't think that necessarily has to be included. Okay. For a cozy mystery. Now, I could be, that could just be my definition though. Right, Rebecca? Like if you search up what is a cozy mystery, they could be exactly what you think. Yeah. But for me, it doesn't need, I don't need that. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's, I'll have to look that up because I've yeah. never really, understood the definition because I think my definition or what I was thinking of it was really more narrow than what Mm -hmm. it really encompasses so yeah yeah and maybe not dark even though like her books tend sometimes do um tackle some darker issues Mm -hmm. the books themselves aren't dark you know I mean like you don't you aren't left with uh I'm thinking of now another one that Larson the girl with the dragon tattoo yeah i never like read that, some yeah. books that are so dark that you were just like i can't go back there i don't want to go back there you know what i mean like yeah. i i don't feel that way about a cozy mystery yeah like a cozy mystery to me is something that i want to even though there's some kind of murder involved i still want to it makes me feel warm hugged and i want to go there again i want to revisit yeah, well, just so as a reminder, the Val McDermott mysteries are 
graphic. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> so and I'm, I'm ready for those, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just looked it up. The series you were, we were yep. trying to think of is, it's the number one ladies detective agency by Alexander McCall Smith. Yeah, that's yes. what I, I knew you were yeah. kind of thinking of that. So, okay, yeah. cool. All right, so we yeah. answered that question. Wow, such a controversial category and I was not expecting it. Exactly. I know. <laughs> I, I made you get on your, um, get out your like thinking hat for you that one, did. I think. Yeah. So Rebecca, that's good. It's too late in the evening for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, well, now my next one is going to be, this is when I think about the kind of books I love, this is totally a hundred percent one of my categories, which is okay. adventure nonfiction. As mm-hmm. everybody knows, I'm, I have now come out as a nonfiction reader. I've always thought of myself as kind of a fiction reader until I started to realize this year as I was categorizing all of my to be read lists that it's like, oh yeah, okay, you're a nonfiction reader. But I one of my I think this is the first book I read that really made me realize how much of um, I'm a nonfiction reader. And it was Into Thin Air by John Krakauer, mm-hmm. which is a classic, came out in 97. Uh it was set in um Mount Everest, the, the horrible tragedy they had in 1996 on, on, um, on Everest. When I read that book, I felt like I was in the middle of everything. That man knows how to tell a true story. And ever since then, I am just obsessed with mountain climbing books. And I've always said, I'm a chicken shit. I would never <laughs> climb a mountain. I would never do any extreme sport like that in a, in ever. I'm too old now, but I would have never done it. But I love to read about people who push those boundaries. And there's a famous American who actually, believe it or not, was from Sacramento. And some of my friends know his family, Alex Hunold, who climbed the, the face of, um, oh, geez, in Yosemite. Anyway, he climbed it free, free, like not chained to anything. Like, yes. Yeah. Was there a documentary? Oh, yeah. Right? In, yes. In fact, I was in Toronto when that came out. And so I went in, to, I thought, well, I want to see this. And I have a horrible fear of heights. And so mm-hmm. I went in and I said to the guy selling the tickets, I said, um, so how bad is this movie? Like, am I going to freak out because I have a fear of heights? And he said, I'm not going to lie. He said, some people have had to close their eyes. And I said, okay, yeah. good. And I had to keep reminding myself that they wouldn't have shot the documentary or aired it if he died. So I kept saying, just watch it and whatever. So yeah. anyway, I love climbing nonfiction, especially. So I would say if somebody comes across a really great nonfiction account of something, I'm going to read it. Now, there's one caveat to that, though. I don't like to read about hot climates because I don't like hot climates. <laughs> so that's been, that's one of my major issues in life when I read is that I don't like to read about hot places. And so if you set a book in Norway, Greenland, Iceland, Canada, whatever, I'm going to read it. But if you set it in the jungles of Brazil, probably not going to read it. And I'm, I'm trying to get over that. So I'll just yeah, say. I think that's hilarious. Trying to work really through that. Do. I, know, I don't know what, I just, don't, you know, it's a, it's a, like even when I was in college, I, I remember I took a class on Northern peoples. So it was like the people in Finland and Canada and yeah. Alaska and stuff. I'm fascinated by people who live in extreme temperatures. That's fascinating to me. But if you're sweating in the jungles, I good luck with you. I like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I don't want to read about you're it. Definite. <laughs> All the bugs and everything. Ah, forget it. I'd rather read about polar bears than like flies. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. I might agree with you on that point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You're, you're next. Okay. My last category, my last book is Indigenous Literature. Mm-hmm. Yep, because I will, I love Indigenous Literature and I was late finding it. Like I did read some of it um, in university when I did my English degree. There was a smattering of Indigenous Literature, but not a lot. So I would say it's maybe in the last five to 10 years that it's really come to the forefront and is increasingly coming to the forefront, I think, in the literature world and in my reading life. And I, uh, yeah, I love Indigenous literature. The book I chose to kind of encapsulate it is Indian Horse by Ro- uh, Richard Wagamese. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. I mean, it's on oh, my list. Yeah. Oh, should I read a little synopsis? Can I read a little synopsis? Yes, please okay. do. Yes. Okay, Uh, so Richard Wagamese traces the decline of a culture 
and a cultural way of life through his fictional characters. Saul Indian Horse was removed forcibly from his family and sent to residential school. While there, he finds his way through the experience through hockey. But in 1960s Canada, he battles racism and the spirit-destroying effects of cultural alienation and displacement. When he finds himself in a treatment center for alcoholics, he grudgingly realizes that maybe the way for him to find peace is by telling his story. And that's what follows is his story as a child through residential school and hockey. And it is beautiful and gut-wrenching. Uh, it's just, I don't, it's, it's beautiful. It's a classic. It's a, yeah. And when I was in Toronto one time, the movie had come out and I saw yeah. the movie and I know that the book is always in my experience, the book is always better than the movie. So I'm really looking forward to reading the book. But the in the movie, the young people who played him, you know, yeah. they had him at different ages. They were absolutely brilliant. I mean, just yeah. amazing young actors. Yeah. I haven't seen the movie yet. I really want to, but I know it's going to not be a, it's going to be a difficult watch. Yeah. So um, I often find difficult things easier to read about them, the written word, than visually. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's taking me a while to get around to the movie. But, yeah. Yeah, I, I just remember what, and that's why, that since I saw the movie, that's when, that book has been on my list all this time. And I, I don't know why I sort of keep forgetting that I, it's on my list to, to want, yeah. that I want to read it. I just, I just need to get to it. So thanks for reminding me of oh, that. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. I could have chosen, uh, there's so many. Yeah. So many, but I'm like, this is a great one to just, to start off with. If, if someone hasn't uh, started reading Indigenous literature, but you're interested, he is a great gateway to it. And in Canada and the U.S., because I've also, my focus has mainly been on Canadian Indigenous literature, or I should say Indigenous authors who live in Canada. Uh, but I've been broadening the last year or so and reading more American, Native American authors. And you guys have a great I, group I, coming up too. Yeah. And I think it, it's really a great time to be an Indigenous author because, mm -hmm. like you said, it's it's more in everybody's um, sort of window of opportunity now. I mean, we're all aware of it now and they're getting more and more opportunity to be published. Yeah. And I agree with you because, as you know, the year before we did that Read Native 21 challenge yes. for the American Indian Library Association. And I encountered and in, was introduced to so many new to me yeah. Indigenous authors, uh, Native American authors. And it was just, I uh, blown away. And again, I, I know I keep saying this, but the David Heska Wandley Wyden oh, uh, yeah. Winter Counts. Oh, my gosh. I love that book. I'm Read still waiting book. for book two. Yeah, yes. Oh, I yeah. know. And you know, I think, I feel like, did he say that he finished it? Oh. And that it's, I think, I'm trying to remember if he's the one that said it's in the hands of the editors now. I'm not, now I can't remember who said that, but I feel like it was a book that we've been waiting for the second book. So. Oh, exciting. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I agree with you. Well, I, I'm going to give you my last category, but I just want to jump in and just say that if I had seven books that define my taste, my new taste, I would say, include Canadian authors, obviously, because I've spent the last three years just yep. immersing myself with Canadian authors, which I loved every last person I've read in that whole journey, and also the Indigenous authors. I mean, I just, yep. that, I was introduced more to the Canadian Indigenous or Indigenous authors in Canada than I was, you know, our Native American, our Native Americans here in the United States. And so I'm just, it's just blown my whole world wide open. It's been fantastic. So, yeah. okay. Now, my last category is, <laughs> it's realistic romance because, oh. I know, because, I, I know, I'm shocking you on that yes, one. Yes, you are. I am. Because I, growing up, I started reading my mom's romance novels when I was 11 years old. I remember being 11 because I remember sitting in class and the teacher, I was showing one of my classmates a book that I had from my mom's collection. And he said to me, he called me out in class in front of everyone and said that I had a dirty book. 
And you could say that back in the day, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, I but, love that phrase, dirty I know, book. Actually. I had a dirty book. And so <laughs> I was mortified because I was a really shy kid. I was mortified. And of course, I never brought another one of those books to school ever again after that. But I was reading those romance novels at a really young age. So because of that, and I read them probably up until like, say, my mid-20s, I am just, I just got completely burned out on the sto- sort of the standard romance, which is, you know, um, Boy Meets Girl, um, Boy and girl, you know, fall in love, they fight, they make up, and they live happily ever after, right? Yeah. I mean, it's that kind of formulaic thing that I just, I, like I said, I've read so many, I just am not as interested anymore. So the one I want to mention, though, and when I say realistic romance, it's, these are the books that if there's a component in it that is what feels like a real romance between two adult people, I... I'm a sucker for it because then I just love it. And you know, the book that we read recently, um, Mary Lawson's book. Oh, Rebecca. Where, yeah. I ahead. hate to interrupt you, but go that ahead. was what was in my head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I knew that's what you were going to say. I'm like, she's going to say a town called Solace. Yeah. 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 That's, yes. So now that's not the book I want to talk about. But yeah. But oh. the reason I, but the reason I'm mentioning it is that's what I'm saying is if there's a little slice of a romance, a re- what feels like a realistic romance in it. Yeah. I fell in love with those two characters. I love that they fell in love and I and I believe that they're still living happily ever after. Mm-hmm. And that just touched my heart. Like I was all over that. Was that book a romance novel? No way. No. But did it have this great romance in it? Yes. Yeah. Now, the one I want to mention though is Our Souls at Night by Kent Harif. And this was one I just I mean, I didn't know he was a famous author, to be honest with you, when I picked up this book. And apparently he's written, I haven't read them yet, but he's written other books that were kind of set in the same area, I think, in Colorado. And um, I mean, he's really famous. He's passed away about seven years ago or so. But anyway, everybody, I mean, so many people love this man as an author. And this particular book apparently was like the last one I think he wrote. And it's about two people in their 70s who are neighbors, and each of them have lost their respective spouse. And they're, I said, they're in their 70s. And the woman goes to him and just said, you know, I'm really lonely, and I think you might be lonely as well. And I just want to know, will you sleep with me? Just get in bed with me and hold me. And that's the, and then they have, they have this relationship, right? And it was so realistic because when I was reading it, and I was younger when I read it, but I thought, how realistic is this? Think about people who have been married for many, 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 many years, and then they lose their spouse. And then all of a sudden, they're sitting there going like, I don't have anyone in bed next to me. Like, I'm lonely. I feel that loneliness of having lost that spouse I've been married to for 50 years, right? Yeah. And I just thought it was such a beautiful love story between these two older people and they did make a movie of it. I never saw it. I refused to because I love the book so much Mm -hmm. that I thought they're going to wreck it and I don't even want to know how they've wrecked it. Now, I always tell people as much as I love this book, I did not like the exact ending. Made me very angry. (laughs) So, So I pretend that didn't happen and that the book ended the way I wanted it to end. Everybody loves this book. Everybody, it's just like this major, major book that everybody loves. So I'm not wrecking anything by telling you I didn't like the exact ending um, because I think other people maybe did. I mean, it's very realistic, yeah. you know, but that is the kind of romance I want to read about. Something that feels authentic and that it could be, I'm telling a story about my neighbor, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I have to read that. And it's really short. It's really short. You can read it in practically, I think, in one sitting. And it is so beautiful. It's just this quiet little story about these two people in their 70s who just need to make a connection. It's like their last chance at a connection at the end of their lives. Oh, beautiful. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Rebecca, you weren't surprising me until that last (laughs) book. That like... (laughs) I, each time, like I wasn't, I didn't think about what you were going to say, but yeah. with each category, when you said it, I was like, oh yes, yep, yep. picture book, yes, oh, nonfiction, yep, totally, and then romance. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm glad I saved it to the end then. <laughs> Me too. Did I surprise you with any of mine? I don't think so. 
You didn't surprise me, but no. you know, when you started talking about them, then I started thinking, like I said, I wanted to add, wait a minute, I want to add Canadian authors and I want to add Indigenous authors. <laughs> like I thought, wait a minute, I should have had those categories. So it, I like, it, well, let's face it, we have so many things as readers yeah. that we love uh, yeah. and to, to distill it down to five um, is difficult, but, uh, yeah, but it was really fun though. Yeah. I, I actually I thought it really was enjoyed it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, same here. So we will put in the show notes, all the titles that we talked about, and we hope that you enjoy this. And we would love to hear if you have five categories or five things that really resonate with you. We'd love to hear what those might be. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And happy reading. Thank you for joining us on our bookish journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing Canada Reads American Style wherever you listen. You can connect with the podcast and Rebecca on Instagram at Canada Reads American Style and with Tara at On a Branch Reads. Until next time, keep reading.